photographing the night sky, he's got a choice. You can follow the 500 rule and capture the stars at points of light as our eyes see them, or leave the shutter open for longer lengths and capture the trails the stars make as they move through the sky. While star trail photography takes longer, you can actually use a stacking technique to get some awesome shots even if you live in areas with noticeable light pollution. In this video, I'm going to walk you through the setup, capture, and post-processing for star trails. A couple things that you need. A mostly dark sky. The moon should be down and you should be as far away from city lights as possible. Dark Sight Finder is helpful, but as I mentioned, if you can't get to an area with the darkest skies, it is still possible to shoot some decent star trails. Don't let that keep you from trying. I'm going to link the Dark Sight Finder site, the moon phase links, and other additional helpful information in a blog post right down below. The gear you need. A camera with bulb mode. All modern DSLRs and mirrorless cameras offer this. Bulb mode lets you shoot as long as you're holding down the shutter button. That could be 31 seconds to three hours. Now you don't actually want to hold down your shutter button, so you need something that will do it for you, like an intervalometer, or even better, the Trigger Trap app and mobile dongle. I've got separate videos about this setup, but this has got a mode specifically for star trails, and the default setting works so well that I just leave it as is. Plus, it does so much more than just star trails. Highly recommended. You also need a lens. Now, the kit lens on most cameras, 18 millimeters, f3.5, it will work. But if you can get a hold of something wider with a faster aperture, it's gonna make your life a little bit easier and you're gonna get better quality results. I'm really in love with this Rokinon 14 millimeter f2.8 lens. I have a separate review about that, it's great. Another option is the Tokina 11 to 16 f2.8. And of course, you need a sturdy tripod. Depending on the time of year or location, you could also use a hand warmer and a rubber band. If you wake up to dew on the grass in the morning, it's gonna be a good idea to rubber band a hand warmer to the end of your lens. It helps prevent your lens from fogging up during the shoot. So gather your gear up, head out to your selected spot, set up, and decide your composition. Now, this is tricky at night. If you've picked a nice dark spot, it's probably really hard to see. So I recommend you do a little trial and error. Eyeball the composition as best as you can just by pointing the camera in the vague direction and then set your ISO as high as it will go. 4,000, 8,000, actually not as high as it will go, but pretty high. And that allows you to keep your shutter speeds shorter. The goal here is not to create a nice image, but to simply get a quick image and then be able to judge your composition. You typically do want some of the earth in the shot, so you could include water, trees, buildings, that can all add a nice balance to a big starry sky. I'd set that shutter speed around eight to 10 seconds, and as I said, the shutter high, 4,000, 8,000, and fire off a shot. Use that resulting noisy image to adjust your composition and repeat. You should also be checking focus at this time. Setting your lens on infinity, but this is where it gets tricky, because not all lenses focus marks line up perfectly with true infinity, so it might take some trial and error. It's another thing that I really like about the Rokinon. When you set it on infinity, it's set on infinity. Another challenge of using a kit lens is there are no markings at all and there's no hard stop. It's very difficult to tell. So one of the things that you can do is find a light in the distance, something brighter than a star that you can magnify your live view, zoom in to get focus on that, and then you know you've got an infinity focus. Things don't have to be as far away as the stars to actually get infinity focus. A quarter mile away at the most when you're shooting this wide will work just well for you. And if you've got a good friend with a flashlight, you can always send them far off in the field and use that as well. So you have focus and the desired composition. Now we need to test our actual settings. You want to plug in the intervalometer or the trigger trap. Now the default in the trigger trap for star trails is two minute exposures with a five second break. And as I mentioned, this has worked really well for me. You can get decent star trails from just 40 minutes of shooting these two minute exposures. But why not just leave the shutter open for 40 minutes? You can certainly do that, but you're gonna get heat build up on the sensor, which adds in additional noise. Light pollution is going to build up too. And if anything goes wrong during that one 40 minute exposure, the whole thing's ruined. If something goes wrong during one of your two minute exposures, it's likely salvageable still. So two minute exposures. I usually set aperture as wide as possible and ISO about 800. One more tip, 
set your white balance to tungsten for a nice blue look to the night sky, and you should be shooting raw. Try one exposure at these settings, wait two minutes and review. The stars won't be points of light, but short streaks. You should still be able to zoom in and judge focus, but you're really looking at exposure. If it's too high or too low, adjust your ISO accordingly. You can also stop down a little bit if you need to, but it's mostly the ISO that I suggest changing. Review again if needed, otherwise start the app. As I said, 20 frames at two minutes each will give you decent results. Longer will be better, so get comfortable. A great time to watch for meteors or just listen to the sounds of the night. Be careful if you're out there with a flashlight, you do want to avoid splashing that light around and haphazardly lighting the landscape. I use a headlamp with a little red mode that doesn't ruin my night vision and isn't bright enough to light up the landscape, but you still want to make sure you don't shine it into or across the lens. Now, you can also do some fun light painting down below the stars if you wanted to, or purposefully lighting cool buildings or trees. That's all up to you and additional options. One other thing to think about is, besides your composition, the direction you're pointing the camera. In the Northern Hemisphere, if you want the stars to all be rotating around the point, you need to find the North Star. Again, I've detailed all of that extra information in the blog post. At the end of your sequence, you do want to take one shot with the lens cap on. This is a dark image reference that will help the program deal with any hot pixels that you might have generated during this period of time or that your camera just might be susceptible to. So you should now have 20 or more images and you want to import those into Lightroom and let's do a little post-processing. I don't have any hard or fast rules about editing. I usually just play around until I see something I like. I have some general tips for working with stars though. Cooling the white balance even more really nicely brings out the blue in the sky. I boost exposure a little, add a tiny bit of contrast and clarity. I often add more clarity than I do in any other type of picture because that really helps the stars pop. Once I have an image the way I want, I'm gonna sync all of the images in the sequence. I also take a moment to inspect the images for annoying plane trails or anything else that I might wanna fix or clone out of an individual image. Now, I export these at 90 to 100 JPEG, full resolution. We could take these into Photoshop, and it's a pretty easy system there, but there's a free program for both Mac and Windows and Linux called StarStacks that works even better. It's linked below, and while it is free, I do suggest you should donate a few bucks if you find yourself using it more than once. We've exported the shots. We now open StarStacks and import the images, and import one dark frame. Leave everything set as default except the blending mode. Change that to gap filling. That's the strength of star stacks. It very nicely will take what might be little bits of dots that film or form gaps between the star trails themselves and smooth those out nicely. That's a benefit of it over Photoshop. And then you can do a little bit more post-processing when you bring that back into Lightroom if you want, but otherwise you should be great. Again, don't let all of the technical details hold you back from getting out and trying. You've watched this video, you've been given the basics, now get out there and make some shots. And then that's the best way to learn.